Van deck, Herc is away. Copy, Herc away. Off deck, logged. Let me know when you are prepared to for mezzos. Roger. And uh, Kirk is past the transom. Copy, past transom. Going to go ahead and enable the beacon. And DAG, uh, umbilical is all out. Copy, umbilical out. Do you have visual on her? I can't see it anymore. Can, can you, can, can you see it? I see it. I can Just ask them to, to oh there, there we goes. go, see it, yeah. Atlanta up. This is an audio slate for dive hotel 1970 UTC time 042351. Mark. Atlanta in water. I'll let you know when we have good nav. Van deck, Atlanta's in the water. Copy, Atlanta in water. You're not diving. You're still on surface. That was a quick turnaround. Got Atalanta, no hard cat. There's Herc, starting to show up. Switching to Rav Nav. There you go.
Ready for dive salvo? And lights. Okay. <laughs> What oh, do you need lights? Yeah, that'd be good. The ocean is dark. Did you do, uh, yeah. You are at 75, the payout is at 55. Just letting you know. Holy Go smokes. ahead, Bridge. Oh, continue. Thank you. I'll wait till we get to 75 and then we'll make sure that we're not. Make sure we're all good on the system. And deck, I'll stop at 75 meters. Control you guys ready for set. control? Ready for control. Alright, we have control. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay. Do you want to hold the ship? You guys good? Ready to stop streaming? Yeah? Okay. Bridge F. Okay, we, c we can hold position now. Thank you. Bingo. Hold position. I'm going to need to back up to get you away from all the vintage. We'll stand by as we get settled first. And uh, yeah, 2190 something, yep. 2196. So we got time, but shortly I will be maneuvering going to put you on the south side of all the stuff, south of the IP. That's pretty flat-ish territory. Guys, NASCAR that thing in there, huh? Check one, two, three, four, five. So cool.
pulling here. So we've uh, opened up questions for the public to join us. We are on the fifth dive uh, of the Ocean Networks Canada expedition. And uh, we've got Pilot Jake, Pilot Dan, Video Ed, Nav Rennie. We've got Data Ulrike and Science Megan. And I am your host, Lauren. Coming dun, out dun, of dun. Uh, <laughs> Auto Iris. Give me a second, it's gonna probably flash dark. Are we doing a um, transect going down? It sounds like we are not. Megan, are we doing a transect? No, we will skip the transect on the way down. Great. Thank you. Do a little bump here. At least try and get Fabio or something. Likes it a little darker than that. Let the thing stand out. Video's going off comms for a second. So for this dive, we are headed to the main Endeavour field at a depth of about 2,196 meters. So it's going to take us uh, probably a couple hours to, to get down there. And we've got a number of objectives for this dive, doing some instrument swapping as well as some um, sampling. So it's going to be, it's going to be a good dive. We'll be online for probably about 24 hours at last estimate, so lots of time to chat and learn about what we're doing. <laughs> Good evening, Lauren. We've got our uh, pilot's uh, control screen up on set three at Nautilus Live. And right on. And showing uh, about a seven zero minute descent. Oh, okay. So. Thanks for adding that in, Ed. I have Adelanta heading all wonky here. Check one, two. You see that? Okay. I don't know if it's because you're not stretched out or what.
Okay. Okay, so Atalanta is still coming around and we have a negative 12 delta. It's now facing Hercules. Do we have any thrusters on Atalanta that's affecting that? Yeah, it's coming undone. Um, did we resolve the problem with the tether wrap program? Because it looks like it's both at zeros again. Okay. 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 So we're, we're going possibly without tether count wraps again, counters. Okay, our delta keeps getting worse. It's at 36 right now. Can do. Bridge, nav. Can you track a line forward at the ship's current heading, speed 0 0.3? Thank you. There you go.
bridge now. Hold position, please. Thank you. We'll go back. Yes. Sure. Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. You can go ahead. Thank you. All right. So we were just uh, taking a moment there to, to sort out the Atalanta and Hercules, where their positions are. Um, and to answer some of the questions coming in, we are flying Atalanta right now. Uh, the work that we need to do for Ocean Networks Canada um, expedition requires a, lo a lot of maneuvering and some pretty hefty equipment. So um, we have swapped out Argus for Atalanta because Atalanta is just a little bit more maneuverable and, and uh, easier to do the work that we need to do. And um, the specks that are passing by as we descend, uh, likely plankton. Uh, I see some little fish, uh, definitely some some um, zooplankton in there as well. But we're, we're getting pretty deep now. We're at uh, 440 meters. So, yeah, as we descend to the deep. And uh, again, we are headed to the main Endeavour hydro, um, main Endeavour hydrothermal vent field. Um, and our target is uh, 2,196 meters. And it's gonna be a long dive. There will be a shift change. I know there's a viewer out there worried that uh, we won't have sleep breaks, but need, you need not worry for us. We take turns. Um, and yeah, and the, the weight of Hercules. Um, I was trying to see if I could find that out. But I thought I, it was 5,000 pounds in air, but I could be wrong. 5,000 pounds in air. Whew. But the weight in water would be different, obviously. Right. And Especially uh, with all that syntactic foam on it. Okay, and it's got a uh, payload of uh, 113 kilograms or 250 pounds. A whole bunch of different tools. I learned yesterday that we swap out the arms, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, we swap out the manip the grips on the arms. The equips. Okay, so the grips. The, the end grips. Of grips. Them. Just yeah. the end. Just the end. Right on. Yeah. So I see we've even got a different grip tonight uh, than last night. This Mongo one is the same. On the other side, I think it's just closed right now. Okay. And the arm, the shoulder is up. Yesterday's dive, it was down for the whole dive or a good portion of it. Right on. Indeed. <laughs> and um, for the objectives of this dive, um, we've got a number of different instruments that we're swapping out. Oh, so it smokes. It's a monster of a dive plan. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a big one. Is this like eight pages, double-sided? I, I have 18 pages. 18, there yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, so, you're right. 18 pages. Yeah, so... It's 18 pages. <laughs> you, we like to do a few things, don't we, Megan? Yeah. We, yeah. we got tired just reading through it. <laughs> but these dive plans, they're, they're not happenstance. There's meetings and meetings and meetings and lots of planning and review of previous dives and site maps and order of operations that go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it might seem chaotic, but we've actually been planning for months on what the dive, dive objectives are, what instruments will be swapped out where, and, and how to put it all together in the most efficient way. Yeah. Uh, ONC has site maps of most of these installations where you'll find an instrument platform that, to, as well as they are able, captures the location of every cable and whether it crosses another cable by going over it or under it or if it's coiled, where uh, every connector is, parking positions, instrument locations, all of that. Yeah, and, and further instrument IDs, right? As uh, we, very important. As we, yeah, swap out different instruments. Um, each each thing is tagged. So and their data stewardship group at Ocean Networks Canada does a phenomenal job of tracking every little bit of information that might affect their data. Um, I spent some of the time in between dives getting them the serial numbers of our time servers, uh, calibration records, images of those devices. I mean, they really keep track of everything very well. Yeah. Um, uh, they know the serial number of the camera that we're using and the last time it was serviced. It's uh, all important stuff. Got it's really important. <laughs> and if you come back later with a calibrator, find out that an instrument was miscalibrated uh, or had an issue, then that's uh, part of their metadata record as well. Right on. Yeah, if you think about collecting data, it, it's not useful if you don't know where the data was collected Go from. Ahead, Bridge. From what instrument w it was collected from, and you know, so absolutely, data by itself is n not useful really. It right. needs good metadata. And uh, we're we're looking at Ulrike right now, <laughs> our data member on staff, doing an excellent job. So here we go, kudos for you and the team. Thank you. I'm glad I'm wearing a mask so no one can see how I'm flushed. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Right on. Um, and, and just speaking of uh, the objectives and, and what we're doing. So we are out in the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vent area. This was Canada's very first marine protected area. Um, protected in 2003 and yes we do seek permission for sampling uh, it has to go through the fisheries and oceans Canada and um, that is all permitted and a, a process that we go through to make sure that we're diving in this uh, protected area um, it's a pretty cool area uh, we have um, venting structures on the seafloor um, they've got neat names Right, we've got all sorts of neat names. We've got the Faulty Towers. I think we were there last night. We were. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, Mothra. What's uh, Dante and Smoke and Mirrors and the Hulk? These I are wonder <laughs> how many of these nicknames come from researchers and how many come from a certain ROV pilot that many of us know. <laughs> Oh, that is that maybe someone many. joined with us right now? No, not with us right now, no. Oh, okay. But uh, we, we have a colleague who's quite fond of coming up with nicknames and names. Right. So I always wonder. And he's been to many of these places for decades, so. Right on. I always wonder how many of these things were named by a pilot. Who knows? Versus a researcher. Who knows? 
but uh, some of the stuff that w are we're, we're going to collect in these areas is we've got a number of instruments so one of these ones is the bars capital b a r s b -A -R -S. and it stands b a r s who do you appreciate <laughs> ready <It> st go <laughs> it stands for the benthic and resistivity sensor and uh, this has a number of sensors in it and it measures the geothermal venting at the vent structures so we're going to be swapping out some of this, uh, some of these instruments, a number of these actually, these bars instruments. We also have a capital R A S <laughs> slash P P S, and um, you know, well, <laughs> kudos if anyone can figure what that stands for. But I'm about to tell you. Drum roll, please. It stands for the the Raz. <laughs> Are you talking about the Raz? <laughs> yeah. What is the Raz? Well, what does it do? Let me tell you. Is that sultry voice Dan? That is. It is. Oh, excellent. We Dan finally have all of our ducks in a row up here. And Dan in the evening. Screaming south at the Dan blazing the speed of uh, 30 meters a minute. <laughs> right on. OK, so, so back to the Raz. OK, back to the Raz. So it's our remote access plankton pump sampler. So this is going to be deployed. It uh, is going to remotely collect samples at set intervals and we're looking at plankton in the area. We're going to be doing some sediment traps. Um, we are going to be collecting some uh, plume samples. So when we're at the hydrothermal vents, it's got this really cool uh, black smoke and people think, oh, it's, it's smoking. Well, it's actually chemicals coming out of the, the venting area. So we're going to be collecting some samples of that. We also have some plans to to uh, collect um, some some larval tubes, ooh, and some palm worms. We're so going to we'll deploy the larval tubes. Oh, deploy the yeah, larval tubes. We'll pick them up in about a year. Nice. Yep. And looking for all sorts of larvae of any kind of living thing that's around there. Yeah, they're just um, they're just sort of vertical traps. And so whatever falls into them is collected and, you know, it, it's just open for a year. And after a year, we bring them back to surface and um, they do their analysis. Nice. And I think we've also got, um, we're recovering a hydrophone. Are we deploying a hydrophone as well? No, this is the, um, this is the hydrophone that we deployed just yesterday autonomously. Oh, okay. Uh, and so we're going to... Hopefully, oh. go and find it Bird on prey. the bottom and uh, bring it back with us today. Nice. The autonomous hydrophone, it's actually an array of four hydrophones. Uh -huh. And it, uh, we left it down there by itself while we dove at Mothra to give it some quiet time so it could hopefully um, hear what's going on with the vents. And because it's an array, you're able to get some directionality to the sound that it's listening to. Right. So, Megan, you Puck, you stole uh, my thunder. I think you, I won't. Oh. Oh, you hold you on. told everyone what a hydrophone is. I see. Which it is now. awesome. It's a hearing device, underwater hearing device, listening device, listening device. I yeah. like it. Right on. This is our ONC branded pucks. Ooh. Yeah, you can't be Ocean Networks Canada and not have your own hockey pucks. <laughs> I have one on my desk at home. I do too. I wonder where I got that. I have one from another place too. Right on. The, interestingly enough, the uh, ROV manipulators grab onto hockey pucks very well. It's yep, the it's do. the perfect grabbing. And yeah. and the what is that monkey knot? Monkey, monkey fist. fist. Monkey fist. Thank you. Those are. You can learn to tie those relatively easy. Right on. Core. Really, really nice monkey fist. I need to put a, one up on the board with a... I should have lost a cruise, too. That should be your goal, Lauren, when we do each. some mapping, is to learn how to... I mean, I have a lifetime supply of them if you ever need any. I don't know if I'm going to be able to achieve that. Uh, you're setting the bar high for me, Megan. Well, you got you to gotta have goals. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, a couple quick questions here. Um, have we seen sea otters in this area? I have not yet. I don't know if anyone else has. We're, we're pretty far offshore. I don't know if sea otters come this far offshore. Um, 
And do we encounter any descent issues with thermocline salinity, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it's like hitting a brick wall. <laughs> the thermocline, Dan? Y yeah, ascent and descent. We'll be screaming along and everything will be great. And it's like, wham, all of a sudden we just come to a screeching halt. <laughs> you almost can feel the anti-gravity in the ROV. I've heard the same from one of our ROV pilots, Robert Waters, who's also an Alvin pilot, and he said that yeah, sometimes the sub will, if left to its own, if it wasn't thrusting up, it kind of gets stuck there. Yeah, on Robert's the actually uh, tooling around off the coast of San Diego somewhere in Alvin as we speak. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. We are a long way offshore, so I don't think you're going to catch a lot of sea lions or seals out here. It would be hard for them to get urchins around here. Yeah. I'm guessing that's 250 kilometers. I don't have a scale on this, though. If only there was somebody who could tell me. It's strange that the protected area is like, a, it's actually a rectangle. Well, there is a, a new proposed um, marine protected area as well. And uh, it, I believe, my understanding is that it's going to connect up with this area. Huh. Cool. So, um, of course, I had my notes somewhere <coughs> right. for the pronunciation of this of this area. It's actually composed of three different uh, words for the uh, coastal indigenous nations in the area. So there's a Haida word, a Pachidat word, and a... Um, can't remember the uh, an, um, another nation in the Nichalnas Tribal Council, I believe, and um, so it is one of the new proposed marine protected areas. Cool. And the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vent Marine Protected Area will sort of fall inside of it, so it'll all be meshed together. Ah. Yeah, it's massive. The new one. Is it all federally managed? We're not nothing out here is provincial. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's all yeah. federal. I'll just see if I can get accurate information before I leave my shift and hand it over to the lovely Marley. So it will cover 133,000 square kilometers. Weren't we just talking about those units? <laughs> yes, we were. We had to talk about this. <laughs> Do you, I don't know if the public really wants to hear no, your opinion. No, it's, it's really minutia. <laughs> it really is minutia. Thank you. All right. Yes, I was I was close. So the Tanguan, um, Hachquiqua, Sigis. Oh, yeah. So it's oh, Haida. Yeah. The first word is a Haida word meaning deep ocean. The Nachalnath and Pachyadat word for the deepest part of the ocean is the Hachquiqua. And the Quatsino word for a monster of the deep, deep is Sigis. So this is... Um, this is in proposal phase right now. Great. And uh, yeah, we'll connect up. Yeah, officially they call it an area of interest. Right. To do this work um, appropriately and, and respectfully, there's a lot of uh, collaboration and connection with the um, all of the, the folks in the area um, to make sure that we're doing it right. So area of interest first. All right. And I am going to, um, there's a couple great questions coming in here. I'm going to hand them over to Marley to take it away. So happy flying. Good night. Cheers, Lauren.
All right, comms check. Can hey, you guys Molly. hear me okay? Yeah. I understand you have some questions for Rennie to answer. <laughs> Always. Um, I do have another question about our watches, which I think we talked about during another watch. How long is the average watch, and does it vary between positions like pilots? And during this expedition, it does. We have actually three different watch schedules. Um, we have some of our scientists and pilots on 12-hour watches, and then we have some of our um, video engineers and communications folks and navigators on four-hour watches. Our pilots will have uh, three pilots on watch, two of them uh, flying vehicles at a time and the other one rotating in and out or working a manipulator as needed. So they get breaks and time to eat, etc. Hey Dan, is there any way that we can um, adjust the camera back so that we're looking at the, s at the sea instead of the porch? Thank you, sir. But we've got six pilots on board and three video engineers, and I don't think anybody could focus these cameras for 12 hours straight. Yeah, that would be tough. I've done eight. I think people are just naturally curious about life at sea, working on a vessel. Yeah, it's a different kind of life. <laughs> it is. <laughs> There's uh, life at home and life on the ship. You know, I find the most difficult part about working at sea is the transition between the two worlds. I think so, too. I can live fine in either world, but... Uh, Trying to get back home and get to a normal sleep schedule and not be all ramped up trying to do a million things at a time and vice versa. Having a nice relaxed home life and then my wife sees a sea bag come out and I start <laughs> packing and that sense of a you know yeah. being separated again. Change is hard. It's all about getting into a rhythm. Yep. Whether you're Completely at home agree. or at sea. Lily, I just want to confirm that uh, we're getting data from the CTD. Yes, I checked several times we have data from the CTD. Thank you. What's our descent rate right now? Are we still 30-ish? 20, 20 okay. meters a minute, okay. I think. Okay. Mm. Oh, can't see. Our descent. I don't think there's a display 30 on that okay, anymore. I was just looking at the winch payout, yeah. which is not as accurate, I guess. Got it, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's still 25 to 30. Oh, I see it back on the screen now. At what depth do you guys like to see the lights come on at the grotto camera to help in navigation? Uh, at what depth? Usually once we're down there okay. um, and kind of driving around uh, within the vents. Okay. A little flash in the distance helps orient, but once we find the um, IP, it's pretty easy from Rogers Pass and then the other way around. But it helps once we're once we're back in the grotto complex back there. Um, occasional flash. Okay, we'll just give our shore a heads up that we're probably 45 minutes out or so from needing them to turn them on. Roger, thank you. Hey Dan, are you on comms? 
uh, lean forward is a yes. Yeah. I'm do you want to white balance on the bottom or do it now that we're at our outside of the photic zone? Um, if you're happy to do it now. If you're able to do it at the bottom, let's do it there. But I don't know if the front porch is late and it's difficult, whatever, if you're heavy. We sh uh, we're going to be, yeah, we might be heavy. So let's do it that now. That would be good to do now. All right. Let me uh, get out of here. I'll give you the Jake and Danny. Sure. I'm full, full wide. Go lose the boots. Um, when you turn that thing on, it might dump pressure here, so you might have to slow down. Hey, Jake, Jake can manage it. I'm out. Try and be a little more efficient by get this out of the way on our descent. That's good there. I'll come in when you're ready. I'll uh, come in when you're ready. Yep, arm is locked. Okay, coming in. I think I need to tilt up. Can we uh, tilt up a little bit? Uh, probably worked for me. Excellent. All right. Look at the corrosion on the bolt. Here we go. <laughs> uh, gain times 10. I'm going to go ahead and black bag them to the camera first. Yep. This is going to make the camera go black. This is intentional. It takes about 10 seconds starting now. What? No, that's fine. I... I honestly didn't realize what was going on. Okay, black balance. Going to go ahead and white balance now. Good white balance. Memory saved, white balance complete. Thank you, pilots. I'm clear. I just had a question about how deep we are going on this dive. And I'm looking at the dive plan. Does anybody know off the top of their head? 2196. 2196. Yeah. 2196. 2196. 2196. A little we're less than 10,000 feet. 1135 on the way down. <coughs> so we're about halfway, roughly? Or then we'll uh, re. Yeah, we'll start catching up. Go faster, yeah. Secure. I just wanted to check and make sure I was in the right spot. Oh yeah, Raj. Yeah, we're going to be about 10 furlongs or 109 chains deep. How many fathoms is that, Ed? That's an excellent question. I'm really glad you asked because it's not exactly what you would think. Hold on, do I have a fathom? It's, <laughs> it's 0. 0.45, I believe. Yeah, right. man, I was, I, that's not where my mind went. Uh, How about leagues? Uh, leagues, it would be, no, league is 0. 0.45, sorry. Not fathoms. Fathom, six feet, right? I think. Uh, yeah, so if we go with yards, uh, 
that'd be 2,400 yards, so probably 1,200 fathoms. Fathom is a distance from one extended arm to the other, right? I believe so. This app does not have cubits, though. So I'm trying to land the whole business oh, that's here. Oh, that was an age not test. In too much that <laughs> trouble over here, but I want you to land here, and we're going to this IP. So I want to kind of land the whole scheme here, which means I might bump this a bit further south just so we land. Um, yeah, because you don't have a lot of forward way, but um, and Atalanta is still moving a bit southeast, but we'll uh, sort it. Still got some time. Um, our V team, if you when you have a quiet moment, could you please try to power cycle the CDD? We currently lost the data stream. Roger. I've stopped the driver. Yeah, we had turned it off because there was a pretty hard ground fall on it. But we can turn it back on. So we're at two, 217K now. I'll watch to see if that... Is it a DC? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's down to like 80 kilometers or something. Could you let me know when it's back up? It is back. It's back on now. Okay, then I'm starting the driver now. What's the ICL? That is the gas thingy. I forget what it's called. Mm -hmm. the uh, isobaric mm -hmm. something. Is that the McLean thing? No, it's no. actually the... Um, yeah. Oh. I thought those were... The gas tights were independent. Is this a separate... No, these are actually connected to the vehicle using oh. an inductive coil. Yeah. Cool. It's the, there's three, like, lollipop rings. Oh, I didn't see those rigged up. No. Oh, I see it. I don't think we're doing it. I can look in bubble or whatever later. I'm not really worried about it. Well, I mean, we could talk about it. We could, if you want to look down at the points, yeah, we're not doing uh, a have a conversation here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, RV team. We currently have RV uh, CTD data again for mm -hmm. now. Okay, so great. So the uh, hockey pucks there, the, the uh, mm -hmm. Ocean Networks Canada, mm -hmm. those are three lollipop yep. looking, um, what we call them lollipops, but they're inductive coils. Mm. So we can read data from the instruments to the vehicle without a hard connection. So we can drop the instruments on the ground, disconnect it, and can be connected without needing to plug or unplug anything. Yeah. Cool. It's those nice. two guys. Huh? Those two. Okay. Yeah. Danny, oh. Danny, did you go out with us on the American Observatory after an eruption? And I think it was uh, Dr. Marv Lilly had an instrument there that was embedded in the lava, and we were still able to use the inductive coil to download all the information from it. I heard about it. I oh. saw pictures of it, but I was not on board. You weren't on cruise. board then? Yeah. It's no. pretty cool. Oh, I we can I look only back sailed at on the Thompson in uh, 2014. Ah, uh, Roger. There was only a single leg, uh, not leg, um, hitch. Con yeah, yeah. Hey, Danny or Jake, speaking of stuff on the ROV, we just got a question about the manipulator arm controls. Um, whether it's a joystick or another oh, type of control. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, on Satellite 3, <laughs> we will show you yeah. our controls. Danny's we'll start the bit over there. Let me Danny. start with you guys want to do a demonstration. Two. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. this one's a little hard. So, if you look at, on Nullis Live, if you look at s Satellite Feed 3, in about 15 seconds, you'll see Danny on the left-hand side moving the parent that controls what we call the child, the actual giant thing on the ROV. So the way he moves it around, and then let me see if I have control over this camera. I might be able to go in there and get a shot. Hopefully I do. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we and saw that at come the same over time. Here. <laughs> so, coming up there. And so as this moves around, is this seven function? Yes. Yeah, yes. so it has seven uh, 
ways of turning around. And there's a button on the end that lets them grab and then rotate the wrist. And that's that's very much like how you hold it when you use it. Yes. Um, so I make and it you as can an extension on my then arm. move out to an extension, and then you can turn that um, parent off, reposition your arm, and then re-engage it and grab even further. So, uh, and then uh, I'm, let me just check this camera before I try and put it out. Uh, okay. And then I have another camera. We have a lot of cameras. There's a camera that shows, oh. uh, yeah, it's right in front of your monitor or between your monitors. So uh, oh, yeah. that's what it looks like. So everything I, I do with this arm, the big arm on the vehicle follows. And it allows me Nothing. precise movement to pick up the object or plug in the cable, pick up the very small jellyfish, whatever and really then we need to pick up. But the do base of that unit, you can't really tell just from the, it is ginormous and uh, quite, how heavy is that? Heavy. Five, oh 10 God. pounds? I'm gonna say 15, 20. Yeah, it's very heavy. It is not sliding around anywhere. And then I'll go ahead and put us back to what we were looking at before. That was an excellent demonstration though, Danny. Nice work. No problem. We're clear. Does that answer your Does question? Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was awesome, guys. Good job. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not like a miniature version of the arm, but in, in some, some in respects, some ways it, it is. It mimics no. the joints. Yeah. It, yeah. it pretty much is a miniature version yeah. of the arm. Um, it doesn't look like the arm, but the function no is No hydraulics. It's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Although, uh, Jake, you were uh, taking one of those parents and doing pinouts on it earlier, weren't you? I was, yes. And how many pins are there, like 25? Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. a schematic. We were testing one of the potentiometers in the gripper and it was right. it's been acting up, so we have to replace the potentiometer. Yeah, it seems like the this model has uh, it's it can be difficult time to know when you're engaged and when you're disengaged. Uh, and so if you don't check that light you can go to reposition it and still act you have active control. Uh, you're driving away, man. Uh, and then Grand the controls for the <laughs> other Grand manipulator are very Off the rudimentary compared to this. It's really just a button. Move left, move left, move left, move up, move up, move up. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I gotta send that somewhere. So there's, uh, it's actually done with the mouse and keyboard uh, using our Argus uh, GUI. Put that on that same channel three. Bam. I think I'll back up a there little more. Just and so put out Atlanta back here. And then you'll be kind of in a safe zone. There is sediment. There could be sediment traps so in the area. So the control of the uh, okay. magnum Careful. manipulator They're on, up in the water on, on the vehicle. So we have wrist roll left, jaw closed, You said this is the first site? It is, right. yeah. But I, don't, I, I want to land left, and then approach down. it. Yeah. Because you know All how the, the offset. All the different functions are in these course. buttons here. And that's how we operate the arm. So it's very um, touch. So it's you tap it to move it a little at a time, and uh, you can get where we need to go. But it's uh, just a big, heavy, uh, brute force solution, not the elegant craft predator solution. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, no problem. I gotta look at this screen too. It's like a backhoe. Yeah, it's a good description. Danny, quick follow-up question. Is there feedback on the mini arm control? Like if you're pressing against something, can you feel that or how does that work? Um, yes and no. So there's actually two uh, functions with this. There's a, feed a force feedback function, kind of like a uh, flight joystick for your racing sim or computer uh, flight simulator. And there's also no force feedback. Um, we don't actually use the force feedback very often. Um, most operators prefer to have a nice uh, loose uh, Joy-Con that allows you to move it where you need to without it trying to fight you. 
most of the time I'm not even looking at the joystick when I'm look, watching the screen and trying to figure out what I'm doing with the arm. Uh, that is my main driver of position. So yeah, the real trick that enables the pilots to do all this work because you don't have depth perception. You only have one point of view, but we have one forward facing camera just about the middle of the vehicle. And then we have a camera looking down from up above. So the pilots constantly look between those two and between those two 2D sources, they're in their mind's eye able to synthesize a 3D view of what they're doing. Very nicely put, Ed. That was the 438th time I've said that, so I had to remember it. What? <laughs> Thanks, so. The exact subscription is I create a 3D yeah. model in my head using yes. the different images, and sometimes I only get one screen, like when I'm trying to use the side basket. Right, yes. And that yeah. is trying to decipher against Two putting very odd angles. Yeah, and putting those push cores back object. are difficult and uh, trying to get something exactly. I think there's six boxes over there. Yeah. Uh, that could be a challenge. And then we also have to be careful where we put things because we can have a something we collect that's floaty. And so if you put it in a box and then go to open that box later, it can drift away. We had a push cord do that once, halfway up on the ascent and just flung itself right off the vehicle. Got to float them, so it turns into an air, air pocket. That new cam wire, I've not been looking at that much. That looks really good. That's, uh, I don't think there's vessel lights down there, is there? I think that's all infrared. Uh, no, there's the A-frame lights. The lights on the A-frame. Oh, right. Right. Those, they have them pointed outboard now. Yeah, that camera is, uh, looks awesome. Uh, it shows us, as Bob Waters likes to say, the angle of the dangle. <laughs> so we have another, this isn't a question, it's a comment, but I think it could be a question. Wouldn't it be nice to have VR goggles when controlling the arm? There are ROV operations that have used VR goggles, and uh, is that the way the industry standards going to go? You think? No, or? it seems like there is like an initial <laughs> jump into those, and then a, a quick retreat. And now they're used sparingly for very specific tasks, typically in the extraction industry. I, I just think it's in its infancy. I think once the technology grows a little bit more and we can figure out the latency and um, the big thing is the actual frame rates that you're seeing in the glasses. If they do not match your eyes with latency, it'll actually cause you to have a headache. Yeah, uh, I also or, think or worse. when you're at sea, it might be difficult to kind of ha justify. It's one thing it's, on yeah. land, but then when you're at sea and the ship's moving and you're not feeling what the ROV's moving. Putting exactly. VR goggles on it and at sea is a recipe for getting sick within like oh minutes. Oh no, I was on the Kilo Moana, we were playing Beat Saber. Well, yeah, if you're stable on a... <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty it's impressive like as it is that y'all are able to look at a screen that is moving, you know, shows water moving, and then the ship is also moving. That I is mean, one thing I about, especially launches and recoveries, when the place that we're at on the ship right now is we are facing forward but for launches and recoveries, every screen in front of us is facing aft. So all the rolls are reversed. Uh, the rolls and the pitches are it's reversed really in front of us. It's really a roll reversal. It's a roll reversal, if you will. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you're feeling the opposite is what you're seeing. So you have to kind of calibrate for that in your brain or otherwise you get a little bit. If, <laughs> if I'm sick. ever editing footage that I've shot topside on the boat, on the outside of the boat, and we're in seas, Anytime somebody walks up, I stop playback and I ask them, you, you know, can you see this? Are you okay to see the boat mm -hmm. moving? Because you're playing something that's moving that's not what our boat is feeling at all. And it really triggers some people. I've learned the hard way. Ask people or just stop playing when they walk up. Yeah, that happened That happened to me, Ed. I was just telling that story the other day. The one and only time I've been seasick, it was your fault. <laughs> Did I do it to you? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. my like, first couple of hours on Nautilus, and we're sailing out of Samoa into like pretty real rolly seas. And, you know, I'd been to sea before, and I was like, I don't get seasick. I'll be fine. 
And then you, we were in the mess and you're like, oh, look at that. And it was a video of waves like crashing up against the side of the uh, hull and it just yeah. looking at the waves and then feeling the motion of the ship, which was different. Yes, yeah, yeah. I just had to run to the bathroom and vomit. It was yeah. terrible. <laughs> that's the only time out of all the expeditions I've done, that's the only time I've been seasick. A lot of people have looked at my work and had that same reaction, yeah. which is why this field suits me better because I can blame you. it on something else. I'm always surprised now when we have people who are returning to Nautilus and they're on board for four to eight hours, maybe the second day, and they notice, oh, the winch isn't there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it, it would be like if we had a giraffe at back there, and it wasn't there, and it would take them two days to notice the giraffe was. I mean, it was ginormous. It was the main feature on the back deck. I mean, it's amazing. My my first year on Nautilus was four years ago, and just how much the ship has changed in the four years since I started is incredible. To think of somebody who's been here a long time, like, you know, Rennie was helping to weld these plates together in a shipyard when it was made. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a... Yeah. Infant welder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was floating down a river in a basket. Yeah. They built this vessel around him. Yep. <laughs> it's uh, forever entombed. Doomed to never leave. <laughs> that part's true. Why would you want a different job? This is, this is great. This is great. Ed, I've got a question for you with the digital stills. Yeah. Um, yesterday when I was playing around with it, it was automatically saving to us to this like tree on the left hand, but this time I don't have that tree. Um, so I don't know where the pictures go. That, I know May was doing some work on it. May thing. She's writing up a new user guide and she's probably oh, okay. down there listening to us in the lounge and sighing and gathering up her notes and her slide roll and abacus uh, and coming up here. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I had the oh, user guide, but she is. it just was like automatic before. Yeah, she's we're, we're uh, a little bewildered by the user guide. <laughs> uh, step one tells you the optimal settings for an underwater camera are between F11 and F16. And then step two tells you if it's too dark, increase your ISO. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you, Marley? <laughs> yes. Just just a little bit. Um, Ed, I've got another uh, quick question for you. Is there a video tour of the Nautilus? Do we still have one there of those is. on the website? There, there's uh, a, th uh, is it a 3D, not a 3D tour, a walkthrough photogrammetry tour uh, on the website, uh, which I've only looked at a little bit of. Oh, time for a system help check. Um, uh, and I think there's a couple of video walkthroughs on our YouTube channel, uh, especially now that we've made some changes to the vessel. I think they updated that. Yeah. Just somebody walking through with that. But the one like of the control room, you can actually, there's hot spots on the image and you can click to move there. And then there's informational pieces that you can click on. It tells you what that device is. Very cool. Apparently, you can also 3D print a 3D model of the ship, which they oh. have on the website. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, we should do that then. We don't have a 3D printer on board, do we? Yeah, yes, we, we do. Sure we do. do. We have a beautiful yeah. 3D printer. Use it all the time. Is Them's that in the ROV the shop? Where is it? <laughs> it's actually in the data lab. <laughs> Next to the printers, the <laughs> like paper printers. We got everything. That is a great thing to have on a ship. Yeah, you don't have the right part, you just make it. <laughs> it actually has been extremely useful with uh, small clamps and different bracketry and all kinds of things that we use on the ROV. It, it's actually been extremely handy. We accidentally printed the dive plan last night off to it and we got a 
the 3D printout of faulty towers. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, and uh, a lot of the parts that we use, the, the uh, vendors that provide those parts, uh, you can order them, and they also give you the uh, 3D printing uh, model, so you can make one to get you by while you're out here, and then resupply when you arrive on shore, pick up the part you ordered. And yes, 3D printed parts do work on the water at depth. Uh, uh, this morning's dive, we had 3D printing printed uh, safeties to prevent the gas tights from accidentally being triggered. But I think those were made at the 3D printer at Ocean Networks Canada. They've been using one for about four years now, I believe. If you look at our screen right here, where is it? Can you see them? I don't think uh, so. Right Here, there. Right? Oh. No. Yep, there they are. Oh, yeah. Right in front of the camera. What oh, are yeah. we looking at? 3D this printed safeties on these gas You can types. tell by the striations, by the lines through them. Uh, yeah. I could do a tiny little zoom. It's at the very bottom left of this image. Oh. That's as far left as I got. Yeah, that's good. It's got the black and yellow tape, and as it comes closer to oh, the camera. Oh, I see. Yeah, cool. Yep. So that protects that instrument from accidentally being triggered too early. And uh, I think the probably the most useful part of the 3D printer is exceptionally precise. <laughs> and that bolt and uh, they screw together just fine. Ed, Ed, you're the star of the show tonight. We just got a I question know. about uh, humidity control yep. on the ship. <laughs> Well, that, that's all Dan. Dan does our amazing HVAC system and then ties it in. We have tons of sensors and we use an amazing tool called Grafana to show us time series graphs. So uh, right now in the van we're in, uh, it is uh, seven zero decimal seven degrees Fahrenheit, 70.7. Uh, our percent, we're 41% humidity and our barometric pressure is 29.9 inches. Um, uh, so we, we do track that very carefully. Uh, our equipment here likes to be nice and cool, but we like the vans to be human tolerable conditions as well. Uh, so we monitor, uh, we, we chill everything in here using chilled water from the uh, uh, vessel and that goes through uh, uh, these blowers that bring in the hot air that's in this space, runs it through a coil of the chilled water and then puts it back into the space, cool down. The water coming in right now is at 52 degrees Fahrenheit, so we just increase and decrease the blower speed to maintain the temperature in here. Uh, unfortunately, when it does get hot, especially when we're uh, tropical or equatorial, um, uh, it can be a challenge, so we have to turn on these blowers that are very loud and uh, we wear aviation headsets at the video position just so we can hear what we're doing. But the temptation is always there, especially at night, to open the hatches to cool out the space. But that lets in so much humidity and salt air that it's corrosive to the equipment and it condensates on the ceiling and the walls and then drips down on you. So. Even if it's cool outside, we really can't take advantage of that, being in a marine environment. Um, but uh, we're perfectly fine with our 41% humidity right now. I don't know what it is outside. Uh, perhaps lower than that. Um, we did come up here to do this work from uh, the port of Honolulu. Uh, so it was more of a challenge down there, especially when uh, even being in port at uh, the Institute of Ocean Sciences, or Ocean Sciences, at Patricia Bay in Sydney, BC. Just sitting in port there, it got quite warm in here. This is just Rennie typing in questions, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear you talk. Adding uh, to the humidity of the room. Me too. <laughs> We've got a good question to get us back on track here. Thank what you. What are we doing <laughs> during this dive today? What is the mission today? 
Um, we are uh, going down to a depth of, what was it, 2196 meters? And we are going to be swapping out several of ONC's instruments, recovering a couple of things, including one of the sediment traps. Is that one of the sediment traps that we just deployed? No, that's a That's an old trap. one? No, we deployed it uh, in about a year ago. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, Megan, would you like to talk more about what we're going to be, just a little overview of what we'll be doing during this dive? So many things. This is oh a long one. This is going to be at least 24 hours. So we've got a big to-do list for this one. This is the explanation. This is the 18-page <laughs> dive plan. 18 pages of dive plan. Yeah, because we're in such an interesting area uh, with a lot of hydrothermal vents, some of the um, experiments that we're doing uh, involve putting uh, probes into the vents so we can measure their temperature over time. And we get that data in real time like throughout the year um, through our cable network, which is why we're Ocean Networks Canada. Um, so that can all be monitored and we um, we manage and make all that data available to researchers around the world for free on the internet. So some of these um, uh, probes, this BARS, which is, stands for um, uh, benthic and resistivity sensor, it actually measures temperature and resistivity, and we're going to be swapping two of those out. They kind of get uh, corroded after a while. Um, so to do that, we have to uh, measure the temperature, insert this bars, and, and what will be interesting is we'll be watching the temperature from that instrument in real time through our data management system to help us navigate and make sure that it's in the right spot because we want to make sure it's in a really hot area. So like we're looking for 300 degrees. Um, uh, and that's how we know that it's in the right spot. So we've got two of those to swap out and those can be kind of time consuming. Uh, we're also going to be taking a, a whole slew of what we call gas tight sampling. And this is a way to um, take samples of the vent fluid and it stays in kind of a pressurized chamber. Uh, so um, so when it gets back to surface, it goes to the re researchers and they can um, do their analysis, and so it's very pristine. Um, we'll be recovering a camera that, uh, that has failed on us, and unfortunately the camera is not working. Last time we were here with Nautilus, we did, uh, uh, Hercules was watching the camera and the camera was watching Hercules, it was kind of a cool shot in, in real time. That is cool. Um, we'll be um, deploying a, what we call a RAS PPS, which is kind of a, like a water sampler and phytoplankton sampler. Uh, so it, it takes uh, measurements sort of on, uh, periodically over time and then we come and recover it in about a year and um, collect all those samples. We're swapping an instrument um, that uh, uh, supports a seismometer. So there is some um, seismic activity here uh, related to the vents. And so we have seismometers in place that measure these really, they're very, very sensitive instruments and they measure um, uh, movement of the earth. We'll be collecting some plume samples uh, so just samples of the um, of the fluid coming out of the vents, but further up in the water column. We'll be deploying a couple of larval larval tube traps. Again, this is an experiment. So we put them on the seafloor, and we come back in another year and see what uh, larvae has fallen into them. Um, We'll be recovering the hydrophone, the autonomous hydrophone array that we deployed yesterday, just over the side of the ship. Um, and we tracked it as it uh, sunk down to the seafloor. And that hydrophone array only has the ability to, um, to listen for about 40 hours or so. Uh, so we'll go and pick it up. So will it be run out of time by the time we get it? It'll be close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's there. It's the reason we didn't dive 
here, right after we deployed it, is to give it a little bit of quiet time. So we went away and dove at Mothra uh, to be reasonably far away from it. And so it, it, it really wants to listen to the, um, to the vent fluid. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a hydrophone array, so it can get some directionality of where the sounds are coming from. And then we're we're taking a couple of other samples of um, of the plume while we're ascending the vehicle. So this is basically the longest dive plan I've ever seen. <laughs> Do you think this will be the longest dive of the expedition? TBD. Um. It'll be the longest in terms of trying to do the most number of things over time. Mm -hmm. We are planning to do um, a two-ship operation later in the expedition um, where we're going to lay a cable. And the cable is about three kilometers long. Um, and so the ROVs will be doing what we call touchdown monitoring, just making sure that the cable is landing in the right spot and that tension is being held on the cable as we lay it. Uh, and that, that takes quite a bit of time as well, but it's not as hectic as this dive, I would say. Is uh, I've never worked on a ship that was laying cable. Is that always a two ship operation or can you do it with one? It's uh, unusually a two, sh two ship operation. Oh, okay. Most of the time when they lay cable, they, um, they just lay it with a cable ship. But yep. because we're trying to land things in really precise locations uh, and not land them on top of <laughs> our existing infrastructure, right. we do this touchdown monitoring in order to make sure that we're in the right spot. So, Megan, are we monitoring the sled to make sure they're not pulling the cable, or are we actually watching where the cable's hitting the ground as they go? So we'll watch... Uh, the sled or the, or the mud mat um, as it touches down to make sure it's in the right spot. Mm -hmm. And then once they start laying the cable, the cable will be under tension and we want to make sure that it doesn't drag the, yeah. the mud mat as well. Because if it drags it yep. like even Can't reach. 15 meters, then it won't be able to plug into our infrastructure. So we just look at the mud mat for the whole lay? No, we'll look at the mud mat. Once a certain amount of cable ah. has already been laid, then the likely, if the mud yeah. mat hasn't moved, it's not going to move. Great. And so we'll just follow the cable as it's being laid um, at a safe distance away. We want to make sure that it, they it, it keep tension on the cable, because when they lose tension, the cable tends to to hockle. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I think last time we did a cable lay, we lost tension. Uh, indeed, that is true. Yeah. All the challenges of working in the marine environment. Down the roof. Extreme pressure, highly corrosive environment. Don't put anything in the ocean, you don't plan on getting back. Yeah, very, very cold. How many, um, Size, do you know how many seismometers are included in the uh, ONC network infrastructure? Um, I don't off the top of my head. Quite a few. We have short period seismometers, broadband seismometers, and we also have a slew of um, accelerometers and tilt meters. So we're measuring the motion of the Earth a number of different ways. Um, some of the instruments, the accelerometer specifically, we use in, um, we have a, a project where we've developed an earth, early earthquake warning system. I was going to add, that was going to be my next question, yeah. Yeah, so that's mostly the accelerometers that contribute to those, um, to those warnings. Cool. And we've got them in the ocean, but also uh, on land in Vancouver Island. This is a good question related to everything we're talking about. How do cables and cameras and very expensive equipment not decay underwater? How do we keep them from, uh, from 
getting rusty. Falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Material science. Materials science, yeah. Really good housings. Yeah, we use a lot of titanium, stainless steel. We use a lot of plastic, uh, coated aluminum, using and zincs, which are anodes that will decay faster than the material that they're attached to. Sacrificial. Yeah, sacrificial. Yeah. But uh, most of our pressure housings that we send to the bottom are titanium. Grade, uh, grade 5 titanium that has been engineered to handle these pressures and we test them to like 125% pressure of what we design them to. So, you know, even, uh, I think the deepest stuff we have out here is probably shallower than 3,000 meters, not like that shallow. So that's 3,000, 8,000, it's like 5,000 PSI, 4,500 PSI, something like that. Hold on, let's, let's provide accurate information. Yeah, our deepest site, so our deepest instrumented site is just over 2,600 meters. 2,600. Yeah. Well, so we'll go with 261 <laughs> times 14.7. Yeah, of course. So that's 3,800 PSI. So 3,800 pounds of pressure on every exposed inch. Yeah, and I think the the question the Sphere wrote in was about having things not uh, decay or corrode from the salt water, but the salt water is only one <laughs> relatively minor concern compared to the pressure. Yes, they all add up to be a concern. Uh. Um, okay, we're starting to approach, uh, as we get to the bottom, I just have a couple questions. Um, so the MEF, the BPR and the SPS at KEMF there, I just want to check on the height of those. I, know, I think the BPR is low, but I don't know what the SPS KEMF is. Oh, um, that's another seismic instrument, so it's quite low. Quite low, okay. So then the only thing that we, have to, we should have to worry about in the area that we're landing is... Um, a sediment trap that we just deployed, and I just confirmed that that is going to be 40 meters uh, in front of you, And but there should be a sediment trap already down there. Correct, yeah. And that will be like 20 meters away, and we I'm not sure of the offset here on the map yet, so just be aware as we're descending of that, and it will be in the water column. And currently Atalanta is 70 meters from the IP, but uh, again, not knowing the offsets, um, we're just kind of being cautious landing in this flat zone here and we'll crawl up to it once we get oriented and situated. Just about approaching 100 meters off, we're starting at our Doppler beams. I'll wait till it's pretty solid for a bit. Yeah, they're already on. Yeah, grotto camera lights are on. Yeah. CTD works. Um, we did have to um, power cycle it at about 1,200 meters. It's back on. I've got the screen up from the uh, from the hurricane. Okay, I'm going to switch you over to DVL. So if we need because we'll have to be watching um, temperature. Going to do a on quick. Descent. And so you can you can find it here if ours isn't working. This, yeah, here's temperature. Reset here. No, this is CDD temperature. Right here. Okay, you should be on DVL right now, and I'll do all the honing in at the bottom. Coming out to full wide. Full, full wide. 85 meter altitude, Roger, gotcha. Starting to get some terrain in Atalanta.
Oh, stop on the winch. Roger, I'll stop winch. Uphill is uh, your heading uphill. That's a good thing. Roger. Yeah, and then once we back down, we'll be in a Zoom in flat. just a touch yeah, yeah. yeah, get the housing out of there. So the DSC is useful for something. <laughs> <laughs> your wide angle delayed view. Kirk, 50 meters off bottom. Yep. 50 meters, Raja. Uh, the direction we want to go, Randy? Uh, from Atalanta, due north, as far as I know, not knowing the offsets yet. Um, and from Hercules, it'll be about northeast. Northeast. So, yeah, let me show you here. We're going uh, to this. That one. Uh, that one. Off screen. Yeah, a little off screen. Northeast, you say? Yeah, going to head up to this, but I'll need to move out of Atlanta in order to get there. Well, yeah. well, I'm going to look <coughs> northeast, Jake. Zero four five. We get right. a little slack there and come underneath. Yep. Double tapped your uh, auto altitude yet? I have not. And we'll do it for you. Bang, bang, Ooh. bang, bang. Now it should work when you hit your button over there. In theory, it might. I'm not sure if I can. If I do it here, if it gets rid of the bug. What happened to my USB? Uh, I'll fix it. I don't know. So I want to come back, drive towards you, and then we're going to take out a wrap. Why did. Mm, I just head east for now. All right. Sorry, Sonardyne appears to have restarted and... Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no. I don't know. Oh, uh, no. Lost in the dark. That will take a long time. I just lost a lot of things. That it's all right. We have at least three sonars and paper map. We're still good. Can you use oh, the Dave Tedarenko method. Find a cable and follow it. Pretty much. There's the light. Oh, no, it's not. That's that organism again. Saw one of those earlier look like the light. I don't think that's not uh, a Yeah, that's, uh, that's if pretty you wanted, cool. If you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could just come under Atlanta. I'm not sure yep. it, it, w it was a positive turn we were seeing. Oh, is that the camera? No, that's it. No, mind. it's that organism, I think. Yeah. There you were there, Jake. I don't know. Yeah, if you just head east, I think. Well, that might Don't be. worry about the turn thing later. Yeah. We'll see how the tether looks. It's not moving yeah. as much as everything yeah. else. Hey, Dan, is that the camera right in front of us? That thing just to the left of the lasers? I don't know. There is a light there, yeah. Yeah, it's Grotto. Yeah. So. Well, where yeah. you want to head for that, then? No. Uh, no, we don't want to go over there yet. But uh. that gives us a good idea where we are. Based on the bearing, I guess. Huh? Oh, yeah. Wish we had a paper map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If that's a solid way to find your ourselves, then you're welcome to start there. Um, no, nah, we want to go barf it's this quite stuff off the porch. Yeah, it's quite far north. Yeah, don't want to do that. We'll find the IP. Just the light in the dark. I'm mad. I just lost all this work I was doing. <laughs> And then we gotta do a dive. 
<laughs> I'm gonna do it during the day. I don't know. So I'll keep an eye on that tether. I don't know if we had the route the whole dive last night. I wasn't never paid attention to the turns counter. Cause Okay, this is called um, ROV now. Do we want to so descend? Are we okay to do that? Uh, we're just headed. Uh, we're going to kind of get our ducks in a row here and get lined out. And yeah, hey, you Roger. can come down a bit while you're headed down. east. But Which one did you have up there before? <laughs> I wanted to kind of see what was happening with the tether here. Yeah, I can come lateral back. Look around there. in our sonar. It's looking okay there. You're, what, 30 meters away? Uphill is on my left. Yeah, yep, down. should be flat where you are now. Yep. So as far as what we know. Okay, Jake. Going down? Coming down. your uh, weight tonight? You got control of it? Yeah, hold that's your good. Altitude up that's all You're good. good. Yep. We'll just we'll test that one more time when we have uh, bottom and side where we're real close. All that jewelry hanging off the front. Basically the same game as last night. Yep. Cautious. The thing must be inside bubble cam, huh? Yeah, it is. They're old cameras, they make a little bit. Five-ish if that makes any sense. That little lens flare at the top. Yeah, this is from one of our lights, is it? I assume it is. If you bump me left or right, you'll find out. But it's academic right now. You can look down a little with your camera if you want, Jake. Just give no, a reference no. on the front of the vehicle. slow. Yeah, it should be, you don't want that white stuff in your face. That's good, there. 
So you got your little feelers out there. <laughs> Steep off to our left, not to the north. Ten meters off bottom. Yeah, I think that bottom in meters. sight. Roger, bottom in sight. Yep. See where we are. Yeah. Got uh, minus 30 Z bias in right now. There's a cable right underneath you. If you back up a little. Yep, Roger. That should be expected. Yeah, there's cable everywhere here. Should yeah. be following it that to the left once we get all situated. It being an observatory and all. That looks like the. Uh, the main cable coming in, is it? The old Rockles cable? Not, not sure. So I think that'll go to the IP. Where are you guys? This so do you have uh, one of the nav screens up back there? Yeah, I'll pull that one up. Which one is that one in front of you? The one to the right is Hype Serve. Hype Serve. I'll pull that one up. Yep. Let me know when you have it up. And then you're down in there. Looks like a Falmat cable. Yeah, so we, we're in this kind of flat zone south of well, the Grotto complex up here. So, so we should pull it around. Oh, you did dial it back. Yeah. I did, yeah. So which direction is that cable going? It it should be that we if we were to follow that to the left, it would go up to the north to the IP, I think. Unless you think that that's something else. Yeah, this is either the cable to Sonya or it's the um, the backbone cable coming in. Okay. But it, I think this is the Sonya cable, maybe. I'm not sure. We're looking, what's our heading right now? Uh, we're almost north. We're almost like north. 010, 015. 015. Yeah, I think le following it to the left would probably give us a, take us to the IP. Raj, uh, what do we need to get situated? Anything ROV and um, video? I think we already went good. Maybe yeah, video's ready to roll. Here. Okay, um, I'm feeling okay about the USBL, but I'll do it again. I don't know about that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move us north. I'm gonna start with Rush. 25 meters. North? Yeah. North. I thought we want to follow the green cable. Uh, yep. Northish. North Atalanta ish. needs to go north at least. Uh -huh. Bridge nav. Step two five meters Same north. Same thing as yesterday, just off bottom. Like Thank you. Up? Off bottom, just keep the cable in sight and follow it. Yeah. Is it not is it still as dusty as the other side? Um, yes and no. Around okay. the vents it's really dusty. Okay. You've flown around in Denver at all? I've never flown a hydrothermal vent, no. Yeah, so uh, some basic things to know. They'll suck you in. And, okay. Uh, they are really, um, and they really <coughs> can be really fragile. And um, it's a lot of obviously debris around because they're settling out. Yeah. But it's uh, we're gonna be. Getting up close and personal, and maybe cooking a few Same lights. Far corner, but <laughs> I think I think this is the Falmouth cable for sure. Yeah, I think way up here there's a bee bag on the top right of the screen. It shouldn't be as dusty as it was uh, last night. 
Yeah, there's just not a lot of Felmet around here, so I think it's got to be Sonya. But if we're south of Sonya, then there's vents down there. I don't believe that we're south of Sonya. You don't think so? No, I don't believe so. Isn't Sonya down by? Sonya is like the most southern point. Yeah. Of yeah, this. we're not we're not down there. No. Okay, so there's some grading up ahead. Oh yeah, I see that. A piece of grading. Where could that be? Unless we're really off, we could be. We were what 50 meters off yesterday, but. Yeah. Let's see. Atalanta has a feature. On the let's see, 20, 40, some bee bags 60, 80 here. out. Some grading and bee bag. That's not on our map right now. Fly up and look at that grading. Uh, kind of dry. It's kind of no man's land in, in this flat area, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't think going north is a bad a closer idea. Look. Yeah, we'll uh, go north and keep fairly certain that's the right way to go, but we'll to be honed in. Tugging. Yeah, I don't... I'll come down a bit. Okay. It's going to take a while to get a move in here. Yeah. Feed bags. Yeah, I'm okay. Add thanks. Five okay. meters. So um, see what's going on. Every time I sit here, I kind of have to familiarize myself again with the slightly. Di yeah. Oh, good. Big. What's that? The bee bags. Yeah, but what green cable could that have been? Is that a coral in the bean bags? Bee bags? Maybe. Well, look at the grading and the stuff sitting around up there. Maybe they can. Mark locations of these bee bags. Can do. Sometimes we go hunting. For I'm gonna touch your camera once. Yeah, that's a good call. Point. How many uh, do we see? One. Two, I would two. say. Yeah, I see two. Is that a Ruckles pub there? Oh, that thing on the left? Yeah, it looks like it could be. Yeah, it could be. Are these pieces of wood by any chance? No. I know, the, those maybe are the mats. A, is that a train wheel, maybe? Those are the rubber mats we used to put the uh, cables. We came around. Um, through Rogers Pass. And oh, right. Put them underneath the there. And this is the train wheel, yeah, that we're looking at down this thing. Yeah. Um. So where is this? Why would there be a train wheel there? Unless we landed it. I think that one year we landed a tool basket with a train wheel and then dropped it to recover the tool basket off the Nautilus. Remember where it was? Uh, would it would have been in this area here, in this kind of no man land. <laughs> like uh, that's a cheater answer. <laughs> it would have been right, right in, front in front of us. us. Yeah. Right around here. Got no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys, I'm drawing on the map. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, we have more cables up to the left. <laughs> yeah. Whole bundle of them. Okay, so there's that's some. That looks like uh, still towards the direction we're going. Up north. So I think oh, okay. the instrument platform anchor. is just to your left. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this adds up that that sense. was yeah. the dropped anchor from a tool basket drop. Yeah. So these are all the cables going around the south side. Yeah, to Grotto. Yeah. Yeah. So the instrument platform will be should be down to your left there. Yes. Yeah. So 
I don't know what green cable we saw, unless that was that was the backbone cable. Yeah, I reckon. There it looks like. Can we? Is that seeking? Uh, it's not seeking. Not seeking. It's because he's up high. Okay. It only sees ten meters right in front of us. I don't know what the white cable. Oh, that's the blue cable. That's yeah. this one here. It's no longer connected to anything. Yeah. It's it's down off. to your left. Yeah. It's it's some more bee bags, and I think that's an IP over there. Yeah. I think it might be straight ahead. You can see it in the distance. Yeah, yeah. at the end of the leaf. Yeah. <coughs> oh, there's the IP, I think. Yeah. Yep. So you go that way, you can go around one way, follow the other cables, you go to the south side. Is this where the cables go like up and through a pass? Yeah. yeah. On the other side, yeah. Yeah. But this yeah. Uh, well, they go around the structure both ways. Yeah. And those rubber mats with all the hockey pucks we were to putting, them. laying over yeah. vents to keep the cables from cooking. Last time we were here. So, uh, from here though, I don't know range of bearing where we're gonna dump the bars. And so, the first thing we wanna do was um, put these two uh, larval traps out. You want those put by the IP, do you? By this IP, yeah, before right. we go to the southern IP. Okay. And yeah, it's the southern IP. Sorry, I was going to jog my... Southern IP is where the where we're going to do the bars thing. Right? Yeah, where we're going to do our bars work. Right. If it's... Or if... Yeah. <laughs> Fabio, do you have a particular spot in mind for your traps? No, just five meters away from the, the, the yeah, IP. La last time we put them off, on, kind of off to your left there, Jake. There's kind okay. of a spot out there where there's no cables. Yeah, anything west of the IP is essentially no cables, yeah. Yeah. They go around on the west side there. Yeah, we'll be at this... Yeah, straight jump over all of those cables we'll out there. There's a little this spot out there. To area pretty s later on in the dive. You go right on the other side of these cables where they're crossing. That's yeah. right where they, where the That's where former lar larval traps were on a previous. Exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna add in one more step. Three one five. I'm gonna go ten meters. Three one five. Because we haven't finished our north yet. And a three one five, I think, will get us kind of. This is low, right? Over here. Yeah. What's that? Low. Yeah. You're yeah. dumping low. Probably because I I'm having trouble kind of driving. Oh yeah. How about yeah. that? That's better. Let go of it for a minute. Turn off your Z bias. Should come back. Boom. Just you just gotta let go for a heartbeat. Okay. You still have that same issue. Uh, fish or something. See it left. Yeah. Right. You guys all right with that move? Ten meters, three one five. I don't know what yeah. that is. We got plenty of leash now, but yeah, well, that makes you happy. No, I can wait actually, because I think we'll be going south. Are, are we gonna explore? It says in the dive plan we're gonna. Inspect Grotto that area? That we're going to do that? No, we're date. not going to do that. We're <laughs> not. Roger. Okay, then I'll keep Atalanta <laughs> where so we are. yesterday's day plan. Yeah. Roger, then I will stay here as long as you have the <laughs> leash for the IP. You're good? Yeah, I think we're good. So wherever you're comfortable landing in this general area to put those two traps down. Okay. Yeah, you want to... Um, face the... Faces. Put your nose into the breeze, yeah. and we'll land downhill so the little feelers don't touch. So if you turn left there, and pick a target. Hey, Dirk. Yep. You don't have the yeah, steel have cam. Down and perch the on that steel rock cam. there where your pointers right. are pointing. Can I take over? You can take over, yeah. Okay. So I was just take some photos for you. Right now, I would go to your <coughs> more big picture. Okay, on this camp, we're okay, over I here. Come down a bit if you're struggling. Yep. We're just kind of east. We're just kind of west of this north IP. Just watch your Africa. 
Yeah, but when you come down, it, it should be far enough away from the IP. But um. Yeah, you're good there. I can see mm -hmm. the AP in the starboard rail cam, so yeah, okay. come line right there. Starboard camera there. We just want to. We want Yeah. Want a flat place to put these traps up. So this is not a good place to land that tool basket. Yeah. Imagine <laughs> teetering on everything. Yeah. Do you want a little spot. leash? You're tugging. Yeah. A little bit of leash would be nice. Okay. Bouncing around, trying to land places. So. If we want to put it here, I can move. I'll, I'll, I'll come down a bit. You'll come down, okay. All right, let's look for a better spot. If you want uh, bring your head to the right a little, you won't struggle so much. Okay. Maybe scooch left a little, give me that flat spot. 